The heroine of Colm Toybin's Brooklyn is Eilis Lacey, an Irish girl who leaves her country in search of work in New York in the 1950s. The pain of parting is eased by her new job in a department store, her night courses in law, and her new Italian-American boyfriend, Tony. However, his enthusiasm for the all-American life ahead of them soon begins to trouble Eilis. Are you sitting comfortably? Then I'll begin. Once the dates for the exams were posted up, Eilis arranged to have all that week free from work and began to worry about her studies. Thus, in the six weeks before the exams started, she did not see Tony on the Saturday evenings for a movie. Instead, she stayed in her room and went through her notes and waded through the law books, trying to memorise the names of the most important cases in commercial law and how these judgments mattered. In return, she promised that when the exams were finished, she would accompany Tony to meet his parents and brothers, to have a meal with them in the family apartment in 72nd Street in Bensonhurst. Tony also told her that he hoped to get tickets for the Dodgers and planned on taking her along with his brothers. You know what I really want? He asked. I want our kids to be Dodgers fans. He was so pleased and excited at the idea, she thought, that he did not notice her face freezing. She could not wait to be alone, away from him, so she could contemplate what he had just said. Later, as she lay on the bed and thought about it, she realised that it fitted in with everything else. That recently he had been planning the summer and how they would spend time together. Recently too, he had begun to tell her after he kissed her that he loved her. And she knew that he was waiting for a response. A response that so far she had not given. Now she realised in his mind he was going to marry her. She was going to have children with him. And they were going to be Dodgers fans. It was, she thought, too ridiculous. Something that she could not tell anybody, and certainly not Rose, and probably not Miss Fortini. But it was not something he'd begun to imagine suddenly. They had been seeing one another for almost five months and had not had an argument or a misunderstanding, unless this, his aim to marry her, was a huge misunderstanding. He was considerate and interesting and good-looking. I mean, she knew that he liked her, not only because he said that he did, but by the way he responded to her and listened to her when she spoke. Everything was right. And they had the long summer when the exams were over to look forward to. A few times in the dance hall or even on the street, she had seen a man who had appealed to her in some way. But each time it was just a fleeting thought, lasting no longer than a few seconds. The idea of sitting by the wall again with her fellow lodgers filled her with horror. And yet she knew that in his mind, Tony was moving faster than she was. And she knew that she would have to slow him down. But she had no idea how to do so in a way that did not involve being unpleasant to him. The following Friday night, as they huddled together on the way home from the dance hall, he whispered to her once more that he loved her. When she did not respond, he began to kiss her, and then he whispered it to her again. Without warning, she found herself pulling away from him. When he asked her what was wrong, she did not reply. His saying that he loved her and his expecting a reply frightened her, made her feel that she would have to accept that this was the only life she was going to have, a life spent away from home. When they reached Mrs. Kehoe's house, having walked in silence, she thanked him almost formally for the night and, avoiding eye contact with him, said good night and went inside. She knew that what she had done was wrong, that he would suffer now until he saw her on Thursday. She wondered if he would call round to see her on Saturday, but he did not. She could think of no good reason to tell him that she wanted to see less of him. Maybe, she thought, she should say to him that she did not want to talk about their kids when they had not known each other only a short time. But then he might ask her, she believed, if she was not serious about him, and she would be forced to answer, to say something. And if it was not fully encouraging, she might, she knew, lose him. He was not someone who would enjoy having a girlfriend who was not sure how much she liked him. She knew him well enough to know that. On Thursday, as she came out of her class and was walking down the stairs, she spotted him, but he did not see her. There were many students milling about. She stopped for a second and realised that 
she did not know what she was going to say to him. Carefully, she went back up the stairs and found that if she moved along the first landing, she would be able to see him from above. Somehow, she thought, if she could look at him, take him in clearly when he was not trying to amuse her or impress her, that something would come to her, some knowledge or ability to make a decision. She discovered a vantage point from where, unless he looked directly upwards and to the left, he would not see her. He was, she thought, unlikely to look in her direction, and he seemed absorbed by the students coming and going in the lobby. When she directed her gaze down, she saw that he was not smiling. He seemed nonetheless fully at ease and curious. There was something helpless about him as he stood there. His willingness to be happy, his Eagerness, she saw, made him oddly vulnerable. The word that came to her as she looked down was the word delighted. He was delighted by things, as he was delighted by her, and he had done nothing else but make that clear. Yet somehow that delight seemed to come with a shadow. As she wondered as she watched him, if she herself, in all her uncertainty and distance from him, was the shadow and nothing else. It occurred to her that he was as he appeared to her. There was no other side to him. Suddenly she shivered in fear and turned, making her way down the stairs towards him in the lobby as quickly as she could. He told her about his work, with a story of two Jewish sisters who wanted to feed him, who had a huge meal ready for him when he had restored their hot water. Even though it was only three o'clock in the afternoon, he did an imitation of their accents. Even though he spoke as if nothing had happened between them on the previous Friday night, Eilis knew that this funny fast talk of his, as story followed story while they walked to the trolley car, was unusual for a Thursday night, and was partly aware of pretending that there had been no problem then, and that there was none now. As they came close to the street, she turned to him. There's something I need to say to you. I know that. You remember when you told me that you loved me? He nodded. The expression on his face was sad. Well, I didn't really know what to say. So, maybe I should say that I have thought about you and I like you. I like seeing you, I care for you. And maybe I love you too. And the next time, if, if you tell me you love me, I'll, she stopped. You'll what? I'll say I love you too. Are you sure? Yes. Holy shit. Uh, sorry for my language, but I, I thought you were going to tell me you didn't want to see me again. She stood beside him, looking at him. She was shaking. You don't look as though you mean it, he said. I mean it. Well, why aren't you smiling? She hesitated and then smiled weakly. Can I go home now? No, I, I just want to jump up and down. Can I do that? Quietly, she said and laughed. He jumped into the air, waving his hands. Now, let's get this straight, he said, when he came towards her again. You love me? Yes, but don't go asking me anything else. And don't mention wanting kids who are Dodgers fans. What? What, you want your kids who support the Yankees? Or the Giants? He was laughing. Tony. What? Don't push me. He kissed her and whispered to her. And when they reached Mrs. Kehoe's house, he kissed her again until she had to tell him to stop or they would have an audience. Even though she was studying the following night and would have to miss the dance, she agreed to see him and go for a walk with him. If only around the block.